Hi, I'm Miklos Kremzer with Choice Based Market Insights, and today I will be talking about conjoint analysis and three common mistakes people make when they do conjoint analysis. These are researchers, even clients. Now I'm going to make the assumption that you have at least a passing familiarity with conjoint analysis, know some of the technicalities behind it. If not, then this video is probably not going to be very relevant to you, but you may actually continue to follow along and learn more about it. But for the rest of you guys, practitioners, here are three common, way too common mistakes people make when it comes to conjoint analysis, choice-based conjoint. Mistake number one is what's called dominated alternatives. And what is dominated alternatives? In a conjoint analysis, respondents usually see three products and they're asked to make a pick, pick the one that is their favorite or not necessarily the favorite, that is that the most appealing to them. When they see an option, an alternative, that is just a no-brainer. For example, you see a Tesla for $10,000 and next to it there's a Chevy and a Ford for $60,000. Unless the respondent is drunk or is not paying attention, um, everybody would pick the Tesla for $10,000. That is a dominated alternative and every once in a while a couple of dominated alternatives is okay in a choice task exercise for robustness purposes, but too many of these dominated alternatives is is uh, is not going to add any information into the data. It's actually um, wasting information, and you're wasting your your screens. You're wasting your respondents, which, and of course, are expensive. When uh, when somebody picks a Tesla for ten thousand dollars, and there's other etch like color, speed, you know, etc., etc., um, you're not going to gain insight into those other attributes because the respondent only saw Tesla $10,000 pick almost every time and you're not going to actually um, gain insight about the rest of the attributes. So that is mistake number one. Try to avoid dominated alternatives as much as possible. So mistake number two is often what clients make and they confuse a choice task with a uh, concept testing, a product concept testing. They insist that their product, the way it is today on the market, is always one of the choices or appears very frequently and it appears the way it is actually in the market. So if it's, you know, one configuration with, um, with a certain color and certain attributes, it's always like that. The problem with that is that you're going to be missing out on uh, variation in the data again and you're going to be needing what's called prohibitions. And the prohibitions are when this attribute can, this level in this attribute can only be shown with this other level with this other attribute. If you keep on showing it that way too frequently, the model will be inable, unable to tell um, why people ended up picking those products. Is it because of the brand or is it because of the color? Is it, I can't tell apart, the two always appeared together. I do not know uh, the value of these two um, of these two attribute levels. I only know them together. So you're going to be uh, making the model less robust. Or the same way um, when this attribute cannot appear with this other attribute. These are these are called prohibitions, and prohibitions make the model uh, less robust. The most important thing that you need to pay attention and remember at this time is that you need to have a lot of variation in the data as much variation as you can because what we're doing at this point is we're calculating the coefficients or the utilities or the values for these attributes levels attribute levels so we need to be able to calculate these and it does not matter if the respondent sees a product that is not in the market today or if it's a configuration that's not in the market today it's actually a good thing Another reason here is that oftentimes clients, um, executives, uh, later on in case, uh, when you're doing what-if scenarios, they ask, well, next year we're thinking about coming out with this type of product. Um, can you actually make a simulation? Can you simulate that type of product? And if you did not have those configurations in your choice task, you will not be able to actually make those estimates and those, those calculations. So um, try to limit your prohibitions 
A choice task is not a concept testing. That's not the same. It's a very different um, approach and methodology. So keep that in mind and good luck convincing your clients. And uh, mistake number three is the following. Uh, when you get your results, uh, the values or the utilities get translated using a statistical formula into preference shares. Every respondent gets a preference share and the preference share is based on the probabilistic model, the probability of that uh, respondent picking that configuration of a product. And you can actually um, end up calling it a preference share, but a lot of times people end up calling it a market share. This is your market share. Well, the problem is this. Uh, when you were doing the choice task, the respondents had 100% awareness, 100% distribution and accessibility for the product. They saw the product, it was right in front of them, and the assumption was made that it's accessible to you. If you could, you would pick this product right now. In the real world, that could not be further from the truth. Products do not have 100% awareness. They do not have 100% distribution and accessib accessibility. And so a preference share is certainly a good surrogate for a market share, but it is not a market share and the distinction always needs to be made. A lot of times executives see the results and say, hey, 20% preference share, that's great. Um, that is going to be our market share. And the truth is no, uh, unless your marketing team does a fantastic job and you guys are going to have 100% awareness or your sales team is going to now have this product available all across the country in every uh, corner of the, uh, of the distribution you're not going to have that market share. However, it is a great indication of what your market share could be. And so making the assumption, all things uh, being equal, this could be your market share, this could be your market potential. Um, and that is what it's for, it's showing you your preference. So this is all, these are the three key major mistakes uh, practitioners of conjoint analysis often make. Uh, please give me your content, uh, comments in the comment section. I'm very curious what you guys have to say, what your experience has been with conjoint analysis. Have you ever experienced any of these mistakes in your practice? And if you'd like to know more, if you'd uh, like to learn a bit more about conjoint analysis, please let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching and I will see you guys next time.